Hey to everyone. Mr. G has finally made it. Internet was being a little funny this morning. Hopefully it doesn't decide to crap out on me halfway through the read aloud, but it seems to be working right now. Thank you so much for joining me today for our read aloud. For those of you that chose to join us, thank you. So I think these are important as we all are living in very uncertain times and kind of want some normal stuff happening. And the read aloud's at least it's been helping me because it's been giving me something to do. And I think it's been helping some of you guys because we get to have our common story again. Um, we'll pick off where we left off with Teddy and book two of the fun jungle series poached kind of give you guys a quick update of everything that's happened um we had another run-in with marge and bubba stackhouse at fun jungle because the carnivore canyon staff person decided to turn teddy and his dad in and it resulted in quite the merry chase a chase through carnivore canyon which led to other fun jungle visitors thinking that another carnivore big cat got loose. In this case, Teddy's dad yelled that there was a lion loose. So that pretty much cleared, sent everyone stampeding for the exits. However, Teddy and his dad ended up at the land down under because that's where security kind of corralled them. Which brought us back to Koalaville, back where the standard, you know, emergency backup koala is on display. Marge and Bubba Stackhouse basically tried to arrest Teddy right then and there in front of the crowd. Teddy's dad makes a scene by stating, how can you arrest him? The koala is right there, pointing at the display. They make a, a jump to try to arrest Teddy, both Marge and Bubba go through the glass because Koalaville was built in a hurry. It does not have the same glass protecting the enclosure of the animal as all the other animals at Fun Jungle. So it breaks pretty easy when two fairly large people go tumbling into the enclosure. They crash into the eucalyptus tree where the Emergency backup koala was currently sitting in, resulting in set backup koala falling to the ground and Marge landed on it. This resulted everyone at Koalaville panicking that Kazoo the koala is now dead and it's he has been crushed to death. The a throng of visitors storm the viewing area they tried to rescue the koala and that's when they discovered it was a fake and it was a toy because when they removed it the head was ripped off and instead of blood and guts it was white fluffy cotton stuffing that is found in stuffed animals this again caused more concern as now the crowd is like have you had a real have you had a fake koala this entire time and you have just been hoodwinking us and that's when Marge threw down the gauntlet that, no, no, it's not, you know, there was a koala here. And, of course, Pete Thwacker, the press relations guy, is like, oh, well, it wasn't always a fake. It, the kazoo was just, you know, he's not here. To which then, you know, Marge kind of put her, stepped her foot in the dog doo-doo by saying, yeah, he's been kidnapped. And that kid, pointing at Teddy, is the one that took him, and we are going to arrest him and find out where he is. This resulted in a bit of a scuffle, because Teddy and his dad both resisted being arrested. And that was when, over the intercom system, that the new operating officer of Fun Jungle, her name is Tracy, called all of them, Pete Thwacker, Marge, Bubba Stackhouse, and the rest of the security team, and of course, Teddy and his dad, to be brought to her office in the administration building, because 
this was a really bad day at Fun Jungle. As if, you know, the previous day having Teddy with Vance and Tim Jim forcing him to do the prank at Shark Odyssey with the mannequin arm. Now having the stampede out of Carnivore Canyon and the scuffle at Koalaville, it doesn't look good. And so Tracy basically said, you need to start looking at other possible leads. Because if you're wrong, and the, and it, and we already have this public thing of you trying to arrest a 12-year-old boy, it's going to look even worse. But she also laid down the ultimatum to Teddy, said, okay, since you're still our number one suspect, you have to wear a security bracelet on your ankle that will allow us to track you wherever you go. Obviously, Teddy and his dad don't like this because, you know, only criminals wear these ankle bracelets that, you know, track where you go. In fact, it, if you're a legit criminal, it actually limits you where you could go. And if you veer too far out of bounds where you're supposed to be, it signals the police to come and grab you. Thankfully, this is just to track Teddy. In fact, if they find more evidence, they said that points to him. This way, they know exactly where he is so they could come and get him. And Tracy laid down the ultimatum also to Teddy that he cannot help in the investigation. She said, based on what I've seen, you just cause nothing. Whether you cause it or not, trouble follows you, kid. You know, you're pulling pranks all the time. You're, you know, causing a ruckus like, you know, the last two days citing those. Like she said, a tiger got loose out of Carnivore Canyon earlier this year. And you and your family were involved. That obviously wasn't Teddy's fault, but again, Teddy was involved. So she laid down that, you know, if he basically puts one toe out of line, he's not allowed to come back to Fun Jungle. And to go further, because his parents both worked there and lived there, she says she would have no choice but to fire both of his parents to ban him from the park. And that's it, you know, outside of if they find evidence that proves that he took Kazoo arresting him and sending him to juvie. So Teddy is not in a good spot right now. The heat is on him. He is being told specifically he can't get involved in the investigation. He's also being told that if you mess up again, your parents are gone and so are you. So we're going to pick up with chapter 10 as if things can't get any worse for Teddy. Hopefully nothing more happens, but as we know, things tend to happen to Teddy. So we'll pick up with chapter 10, titled Good Call. So we have Teddy leaving Tracy's office now. I expected my parents to be angry when they heard Tracy had threatened their jobs, enraged even. But they weren't. Instead, they just accepted the news sadly. You're not upset? I asked, asked at dinner that night. It's not fair. Maybe not, but I understand Tracy's reasons, Mom said. This park has had a lot, has had more than its share of disasters, and you've been involved in every one of in every one. That's not true, I protested. I didn't kill Henry. I didn't set the tiger or the mamba free. I didn't say you caused all of them. I just said that you were involved. Mom gave me an unusually hard glare across the table. Are you upset at me? I asked again. We told you to stay away from this investigation, Mom chided, and the first thing you did was run off to Koalaville, and then you led Marge and Bubba right back there. That wasn't his fault, Dad told her. He was only trying to get away from them, which he wouldn't have done if you had if you had been more careful. Mom shifted her glare now onto Dad. You're just as much to blame for this madness today as he is. I was trying to protect our son, Dad argued. You shouted that a lion was loose in the middle of a crowd, Mom said coldly. Dad looked down at his meatloaf. I didn't have time to think. I was trying to help Teddy. I know you were, Mom said, but it was a mistake. We can't afford any more of them. So, she turned back to me, you need to listen to Tracy and stay away from Koalaville. Don't make any more waves and try to keep out of trouble. 
All right, I said. It ought to be easier now, anyhow, seeing as Marge and Bubba aren't hunting me down. The electronic bracelet was now clamped around tight around my ankle. Bubba had locked it on right after I left Tracy's office. It was surprisingly large and bulky. The plastic strap was three inches wide, while the GPS transmitter was about the size of a cell phone. We could track you anywhere you go with that, Bubba had warned me. And right now, the only place you're approved to go besides Fun Jungle is school. If you try to make a run for it, we'll know. And then we'll get you and toss you into the juvenile facility. The bracelet wasn't very comfortable. The plastic strap was already rubbing my skin raw and making my ankle sweat, even though it was freezing outside. I itched right beneath the transmitter where it was impossible to scratch. Now I tried to jab the blade of a butter knife under it to give me some relief. Careful with that, Mom told me. If it breaks and the signal drops, the police will be probably come running. I sighed and set the knife back on the table. Marge and Bubba still think that I'm the one who poached Kazoo. What if they don't try to look for any other thieves? Don't worry, Dad said. Somehow we'll find a way to prove you didn't take Kazoo. I'm not worried about me, I replied. I'm worried about that koala. Christy said he'll starve in another two days. Mom and Dad shared a look, and then turned back to me. Both, uh, both looked pained by what they had just had to say next. Even so, Dad said, that doesn't mean you have to save him. Tracy gave you specific orders to stay away from the investigation. I know you want to do the right thing, but Kazoo isn't worth losing our jobs over. But he could die, I began. It's not your job to save him, Dad said sadly. It's not any of our jobs. If Kazoo dies, and I truly hope that doesn't happen, it won't be because we failed him. It will be because Marge and the rest of the Fun Jungle Security did. I stared back at him, feeling angry and helpless. I was upset with my own that my own father was putting his career and my mother's before the welfare of Kazoo. But I also knew that he was right. Just because I had solved one crime at Fun Jungle didn't mean that I could solve another one. And my involvement so far had been pretty disastrous. Although, I certainly wasn't the only one responsible for that. Can I be excused from dinner? I asked. I don't feel very hungry anymore. Mom and Dad exchanged another look, this one a bit sad. Of course, Mom said. Teddy, I know all of this isn't easy to hear. We just want you to know we don't blame you for anything that's happened. Sometimes these events, we simply cannot something, maybe stick around and let them explain their reasons to me a bit more. But I didn't feel like it. feel like talking to anyone. This time was almost as crazy as Henry's funeral. It wasn't my fault, I said quickly. I know that, Summer replied. It's the adults who screw things up here, as usual. You just have a talent for ending up in the middle of things. I really wish I didn't. I wish I had been there today. I would have loved to see March flatten the fake koala in front of everyone. It must have been hilarious, especially Pete tried to explain it all. I don't know what he was thinking, putting the toy in the exhibit. Serves him right for how all, all this went. I thought back to the events in the koala exhibit, imagining it from someone else's perspective. I have to admit, Summer, it's actually pretty funny. Summer laughed. I hear Tracy Boyd chewed out Pete Thwacker and Marge pretty hard afterward. Any bit of joy I felt quickly dissipated. Tracy got on my case, too. In fact, she told me that if anything like this happens again, she'll fire my parents. Summer stopped laughing. Listen, Teddy, did you tell your dad about this? Maybe he can convince Tracy to go easy on them if I screw up again. I'm sorry. I can't. Sure you can. You're his daughter. You're practically the only person he'll listen to. That wasn't Tracy's decision to threaten your parents. It was Dad's. I stared at Summer a moment, feeling stunned and betrayed. I thought your father liked my parents, I finally said. He does, Summer bit her lip. Obviously, 
something uncomfortable about what she had to say. It's just that he's a businessman, and what happened today was very bad for business. Do you agree with him? I see his point. Fun Jungle's not doing so well, Teddy. And every time something like this happens, it scares away more tourists. I thought you said it was hilarious. It was, to me, but not to everyone else in America. Fun Jungle's doing poorly enough as it is. Remember how my dad was thinking about building roller coasters through the animal exhibits? I did. My parents and I had found the plans. It would have been disastrous for the animals if JJ had gone through with them. I thought he promised he'd never do that. Well, he's getting desperate enough to break that promise. The park's in trouble, and today's disaster didn't exactly help things. So you want me to back off trying to find who took Kazoo, too? I asked. No, Summer said quickly. I only said I understand why my father did what he did, and that's why I can't get him to undo Tracy's orders. But as for finding out about Kazoo, you have to keep investigating. I scowled, frustrated with the mixed messages I was getting. Your father will fire my parents if I do any investigating. No, he'll fire them if you cause another disaster. I can't control that. I'm not trying to cause all this trouble. My parents say that I just need to back off and let Marge handle the case. I don't think that'd be in your best interests, Summer said. And why is that? Because Marge is stepping up her attempts to prove that you're the thief. She just emailed my father a whole report detailing how she's positive you did it. How did you get it? I asked. I know Daddy's email password. Sometimes on a day like today, I like to check in to see what's going on. Lucky for you, I did. She's really out to get you for this. But Tracy told her she better find the thief as soon as possible. Her heads were rolled. Yes, and Marge is convinced that you are that thief. To her, filing any other leads is a waste of time, so instead she's doubling down trying to prove you're guilty. I rub my temples, trying to understand Marge's thinking was giving me a headache. So Tracy tells Marge to find the thief to get away. Yes, although Marge wouldn't see it that way. Any idea what she has on me? Nothing new. You're caught on video coming out of the koala exhibit the night Kazoo got kidnapped, and no one else is. But you have to admit, that's pretty strong stuff. If someone else stole the koala, how did they do it without being recorded? That's what Marge is supposed to be finding out, I said sullenly. Well, she is not, Summer said. She's only building a case against you, which means the real bad guy is still out there with Kazoo somewhere, and no one's looking for him. That's why you have to try to figure it out who did it. I can't do that, I told her. If Kazoo isn't found soon, he's going to die. And if I were there, you know I'd be helping you find him. That's easy for you to say. If you get caught investigating, your father isn't going to lose his job. Summer sighed. She seemed disappointed in me. Look, Teddy, I know this is asking a lot. It's asking a ton. But Kazoo needs needs you. No one else is helping him. You were willing to look for Henry's killer when no one else was. And Henry's life wasn't even in the balance. He was already dead. I frowned. I was feeling disappointed in myself, too. There are di Things are different this time, I argued. Can't you get your father to replace Marge with someone who actually knows what they're doing? My father doesn't know Marge like you and I do. He trusts her. Why? Because he didn't promote Marge to be a detective. No one expected there would be another case like this. Marge is the only supposed to be the head of security, which isn't exactly brain surgery. The biggest crime at theme parks is usually shoplifting, and Marge is great at busting shoplifters. She has really made a dent in crime at Fun Jungle since she took over as head of security. Maybe, but she has no idea how to catch a real criminal. Doesn't your dad understand that? No, what would make him understand, Summer asked, you finding the real kidnapper. Then he'd realize it wasn't a fluke when you and I found Henry's killer. He thinks we just got lucky? I don't know, maybe, but think. 
if Marge is spending all this time trying to prove you're the criminal, then you figure out who the criminal actually is, and then you reveal Marge to be a complete bozo, Dad won't be able to ignore that. He'll give her the axe, and, he, and he'll never even think about firing your parents again. He'll see you as an asset rather than a liability. He should already see me as an asset, I said. I've already solved one crime here, haven't I? Which means you can solve this one, too. And I'll be available to help you in any way that I can. So what do you say? Summer batted her eyelashes at me. Although she didn't do it in an exaggerated way. Playing up the damsel in distress thing. Please, will you do it for me? I took my time before answering her. Although I have been given a lot of reasons to stay clear of investigation. Summer had given me a decent number of number to investigate as well. To my surprise, despite all the threats, I realized I wanted to help find Kazoo. In part, this was because I was worried about the koala, and it seemed like the right thing to do. In part, it was wanting to prove my Aunt Marge's idiocy. And in part, it was because I was excited to have another adventure with Summer. Talking to her now, I realized how much I had missed her over the past few months. Investigating would give us an excuse to have lots of more conversations. However, I still had plenty of concerns. How am I even supposed to do this, I asked. I can't just wander over to Koalaville and start poking around for clues. Summer broke into a big, brilliant smile. Does this mean you're in, she asked, to help find Kazoo? I'm thinking about it, and I said, it won't be easy. I don't even know where to start. I do. Where? How did the thief get in and out of the koala exhibit without being seen? I shrugged. I have no idea. Exactly, Summer told me. And neither does anyone else, except the thief. No one's even tried to figure it out yet. But it's important, right? I mean, it couldn't have been easy to get into the exhibit. Right, I agreed. There's only one door with a, with a keypad entry, and then there are four security cameras outside. So there's no way anyone could get through all that without leaving some evidence behind. I'm not so sure. After all, the thief didn't show up on any of the cameras. That's just not possible, Summer told me. A ghost didn't steal a kazoo. I don't know how they avoided being filmed, I said, but they did. Are you sure there's nothing on any of the cameras? I thought back to the conversation I had with my father at Carnivore Canyon that afternoon. No, I admitted. My dad said he was going to watch all the footage tonight, though. So, when's that happening? I realized I hadn't heard my parents in a while. I crept to my door and peered out. Sure enough, Dad was at his computer on the kitchen table. He and Mom were both watching the security tapes. It's happening right now, I reported to Summer, but it's going to take a while. It's almost 12 hours of footage. Well, let's hope they find something, Summer said. In the meantime, there's still a security door to consider. Oh, so. It has a keypad entry, Teddy. Only the keepers know the entry code for it. I thought about that for a moment. No one else does? Not maintenance or the security? Not that I know of. It's designed to protect the animals. If maintenance or security needs to get in anywhere, a keeper has to let them in. Does anyone else have the entry code for all the doors like you do? No, and I don't have that one anymore, thanks to you. Daddy wasn't very happy to find out that I knew his and had passed it on to you, so he changed it. Oh, sorry. Don't sweat it, Summer told me. You've got enough to worry about. Now, do, do you know all the koala keepers at Fun Jungle? I shook my head. The only one that I know well is Christy Sullivan. She's the head keeper, so she's been there most days. But there are some others who fill in for her on the weekends and such. I'm not even sure of their names. Hold on, I'll get them. Summer popped up, propped up her phone and got on her computer. What are you looking at, I asked. The administration database for Fun Jungle. Are you supposed to have access to that? 
Of course not. Summer gave a triumphant cry. Here we go. Assistant koala keepers are Elizabeth Ames, Jennifer Weeks, and Ashley Thomas. That sounds right. Think any of them could have pitched Kazoo? Definitely not Christy, I said quickly. Why not? Summer shot back. She just wouldn't have, I said. She cared about Kazoo too much. Maybe she cared so much that she wanted him as a pet. No, she's not like that. In fact, she was helping me come up with other suspects today. Maybe she was only doing that to divert attention from, away from herself. She didn't do it at all. She didn't do it, all right? I was surprised by about how defensive I was where Christy was concerned. She wouldn't have. Summer raised her hands. Okay, take it easy. I'm only trying to make sure that we don't rule anyone out too quickly. But if you say we can trust her, we can trust her. Good, I said. Although, uh, although as I did, a thought n niggled at the back of my mind. Could we really trust Christy? Did I know her as well as I thought I did? What about the others, Summer asked. I don't really know any of them at all, I said. I suppose they could have done it. I guess you'll have to investigate them a bit, bit closer then, Summer told me. And while you're at it, you should have a look around the exhibit. Make sure there's no way to get in besides the security door. And if there's not, that narrows down our suspects quite a bit. And if there is, then maybe the maybe it offers a, another clue as to who the thief is. I nodded in agreement. There's one big, big question, though. How am I supposed to do any of this? Tracy gave me a direct order, thanks to your dad, to lay off the investigation. You'll just have to do it without being seen, then. And how exactly am I supposed to do that? It's easy. Summer flashed a wide, knowing grin. As usual, I have a plan. Chapter 11, The Toilet of Doom. Once Summer had told me her plan for how I could investigate unnoticed, I had to admit, it was pretty clever. However, I had to wait before I could put it into action. I had to go back to school. I returned the next day, the monitoring bracelet strapped to my ankle. Worried that it looked dorky and branded me as a potential criminal, I did my best to hide it under the cuff of my jeans, but it was still noticeable if anyone looked at my ankle looked at my feet no one said anything except xavier of course but i got the sense that everyone was staring at me when i tried to catch them at it they all pretended to be doing something else but the moment i turned away again i could feel all their lies return to me i made it halfway through the day before vance jessup caught caught up with me I was on my way to lunch with Xavier. We were a little late as Xavier's locker had been jammed and the hallways had cleared out. We were about to enter the cafeteria when Vance and Tim Jim blocked our path. Hey, Teddy, Vance said, completely ignoring Xavier. We missed you yesterday. Where were you? Sick, I said, trying to duck past him. He stuck out on an arm, blocking my path. Sick my butt. You've been up to no good, haven't you? No. That's a nice piece of jewelry you've got there. Vance pointed the ankle bracelet and Tim Jim snickered. Where'd you get it? It's a long story, I said, and I'm late for lunch. I tried to squirm class Vance again, but this time he seized my shoulder. It's not because of our little prank the other day, is it? He asked. No, I told him. Vance clamped his hand, his other hand, under my jaw and then forced my chin up so I had to look him in the eye. You're sure? Because if the police are involved, you better not rat me out. That'd be a very bad idea. To drive the point home, he gave my shoulder a menacing squeeze. He barely flexed his fingers, and yet it felt as though he was leaving divots in my shoulder blade. Teddy is not lying to you, as Xavier said quickly. The bracelet's not for the shark prank. It's because the cops think Teddy stole a koala from Fun Jungle. Vance swiveled his giant head toward Xavier. Xavier surprised, then looked at Tim Jim, then back to me. Is that true? He asked. Yes, I admitted. 
Vance let go of me in surprise, and then he broke into a weird strangled laugh. Tim Jim laughed even harder. You and asked incredulously. You're a suspect in that? I didn't do it. I was framed. Sure you were. Vance turned to Tim Jim. Wow, we get this kid to pull one prank, and the next thing you know, he's off stealing koalas. He's telling the truth, Xavier said. Vance stopped laughing and glared at Xavier. Bug off, he snarled. Okay, Xavier scurried into the cafeteria. Vance returned his attention to me. Well, Teddy, now that you've got a taste for this, my posse and I were just talking about how we ought to pull another prank of Fun Jungle. I went, there was no way I could do anything like that again. Not with my parents' jobs on the line, but saying no to Vance is always a dangerous proposition. I decided to try using logic instead. We can't. We almost got busted last time. That's what made it so classic, Vance crowed. When the cow from security slipped in the puke, I laughed so hard I almost busted a gut. Now we've been thinking about what to do next. We've come up with a good one. What if we do the same sort of thing that we like we did in the shark tank, only with the lions? But this time, instead of just an arm, we put a whole mannequin in the cage and cover it up with ketchup so it looks like there's a, like there's a dead, bloody person in there. Maybe we could even get some calf's brains to really sell it. I shook my head desperately trying to get out of this. It won't work. Lion's exhibit is completely fenced off. There's no way for us to get to the body inside. Oh, Vance said disappointed. Well, what about doing it with the tigers? All carnivore exhibits are the same, I said. It was a lie, but I figured Vance didn't know fun jungles as well as I did. Shark Tank's the only one you can get things into. And after our prank the other day, they've really set up, stepped up security there. There are now two guards posted full time now. Vance frowned, buying my story. Okay, then, how about this? You know about cow tipping, right? I nodded, worried where this was going. Cow tipping was the act of sneaking into a ranch, finding a sleeping cow, cow sleep standing up, and shoving it over. It was the sort of thing incredibly bored teenagers in the sticks were rumored to do. Well, we're pretty good at it, Vance said. In fact, we're so good, it's not very exciting anymore. The cows all just lie there after you shove them over. I wondered what Vance ever thought a sleeping cow would do after being shoved over that would qualify as exciting. Explode, perhaps? But, Vance went on, we know all there's all kinds of crazy animals at Fun Jungle that would be a lot more interesting than cows. Rhinos and hippos and all those weird freaky antelope. I mean, how cool would it be to shove over a sleeping rhino, right? He laughed at the thought of this, and Tim Jim echoed it. I couldn't believe what I was hearing. It wouldn't be very cool, I said. It'd be idiotic. Rhinos are incredibly dangerous. They simply trample you to death the moment you came near them. Vance stopped laughing, and his eyes narrowed angrily. Did you just call me an idiot? I gulped. I had been so astonished by the insanity of Vance's idea, I forgot to properly be properly submissive to him. Uh, no, I wasn't talking about you. I was talking about your plan. Yeah, Vance snarled. You said it was idiotic, which means you think I'm an idiot. No, I said. I just think that you don't understand how dangerous rhinos are. A lot of people make that mistake. I tried to back it away, to back away. Vance didn't let go of me. Instead, he clamped one hand on my shoulder again and then shook a fist in front of my nose. Nobody calls me an idiot, he growled. Vance had been in a fight recently. His knuckles were wrapped in bloody bandages. I stared at them, terrified that in the next few seconds, some of my blood was going to be adorning them as well. I didn't mean to insult you, I said. I was only trying to explain. I ought to punch your lights out, Vance told me. But we need you, so I'll give you a choice. Either you help us prank Fun Jungle again, or feel the pain. 
I should have just agreed to the prank. It would have been a lie, of course, but it might have convinced Vance not to hurt me for a little while. But instead, I made the mistake of trying to reason with a bully. We'll never get away with another prank, I protested. We were lucky to get away with the last one. Forget about it. That sounds like you're... Sounds a lot like you're saying no to me, Vance growled. So I'm going to give you one last chance to change your mind. I'm trying to protect you, I told him. You guys try anything else at Fun Jungle and they'll be ready for you. We'll all get busted. Don't give me that, Vance said. We're j you're just chicken, he turned to Tim Jim. Looks like Teddy here has chosen to feel, pain, feel the pain. Let's give him a swirly. Before I even knew what was happening, Vance had shoved me toward Tim Jim, who grabbed my arms and hoisted me off the ground. Xavier had told me had told me about swirlies. They were by far the worst of a long list of abuses Vance and his pals were known to dole out. The victim was dragged to the most disgusting toilet in the school, inserted headfirst into it, after which Vance would flush it. There was a great deal of competition for the most disgusting toilet at our school. Many of them tended to be clogged and were thus full of more poop than Fawn Jungle's hippo pools. Although I really didn't want to cause any more trouble at the park, I wanted to get a swirly even less. Wait, I said, let's talk about this. You already had your chance to talk, Vance. Led the way to the bathroom, gritting devilishly. Help! I yelled desperately looking for anyone else and to my dismay all the other students were either at lunch or very wisely staying away staying out of Vance's sight i thrashed about trying to break free from tim jim's grip or at least boot one of them in the shins but they held my arms tight and kept their legs away from mine with the skill with the skill of the boys who performed swirlies many times before Vance kicked open the door to the boys' bathroom, closest to the cafeteria. This bathroom is renowned to be one of the least sanitary places at the school, if not on the planet Earth. Someone, probably Vance, had wrecked the pipes with cherry bombs. The toilets still worked, in theory, but they tended to back up and overflow. Thus, this bathroom was generally avoided like the plague. I think even the janitors stayed clear of it. It looked as though it had been several weeks since the last cleaning. Toilet paper was strung everywhere. Water was puddled on the floor. The place smelled worse than anywhere I'd ever been, which was saying something, given that I lived at a zoo. Please, Vance, I pleaded. Don't do this. I'll do whatever prank you want. I wasn't proud of myself, but I was. But desperate times call for desperate measures. You want to tip rhinos? Fine. We go tip rhinos. Maybe I made a mistake in talk, talking them out of this before. I should have let them try it and get all and all get trampled. Vance acted like he can, didn't he even hear me. He now seemed more excited about the swirly than about the, any prank at Fun Jungle. Let's do stall five, he said. That one's been really foul lately. Tim Jim laughed, although rather than the usual snickering, this sounded almost diabolical. The boys upended me and carried me to stall five. I knew about stall five. It was the worst of the worst. The kids at school called it the toilet of doom. I stopped pleading. It wasn't doing any good. Plus, given that I was about to end up head first in, a fo in foul water, I thought it was best to keep my mouth closed. Vance opened up stall five in fake gasp of disgust for my benefit. Ooh, this is even worse than usual. It looks like someone with a disease used it today and got and forgot to flush it. Tim Jim laughed again and carried me forward. I caught my first glimpse of the toilet of doom it was even worse than i had ever imagined i shut my eyes held my breath and prepared for the worst before tim jim could plunge me in however the bathroom door banged open 
Put him down, someone said. I couldn't see who was speaking since I was facing the wrong way and unable to turn around, but the voice was obviously that of a fellow student rather than a teacher. I could see Vance, though, although it was a little harder to make out his expression as I was upside down looking up at his nose. Looking up his nose. At first, he seemed to be a little bit unsettled by whoever had entered, but he quickly played the tough guy again. You gonna make me? No, said the second person entering. We're going to make you. Now that he was facing two people, whoever they were, Vance's tough act faltered, though he struggled to seem imposing. There's three of us, he said. Try anything and we'll crush you. I don't think so, the first voice said calmly. Now put the kid down. Tim and Jim turned around, taking me with them so I could see could now see who had come to my rescue. It was Ethan Sokol and Dashiell Dashiell Alexander. They were eighth graders and better yet, stars of the school football team. In the in Texas middle school system, this meant they might as well have been gods. Ethan was a wide receiver, and Dash was the quarterback. Though neither was quite as big as Tim Jim, they were in much better shape. I had no idea what they were doing standing up for me. Neither ever so much as said a word to me before. Up to that point, I'd have guessed that they didn't know I existed. Well, I hope these two football players are being good examples of not being bystanders in a bullying situation. They need to... They are, they are not participating in it. They are trying to stop it. And that's how you need to be in school. You don't want to be an unwilling participant. This isn't any of your business, Vance told them. Just walk away. I noticed that Vance was saying this from the safety, from safely behind Tim Jim rather than out in front of them. Ethan and Dash came toward us unfazed. Put the kid down, or we will make you, Ethan warned. Tin Jim flipped me upright and set me on my feet, although this wasn't out of any kindness. They were simply getting ready to attack. Before I could make a move, Vance locked his arms around me, holding me tight. Get him, he yelled. Tim Jim lunged forward as obediently as hunting dogs. Ethan and Dash were ready, though. Ethan quickly sidestepped Tim and then used the thug's momentum against him, grabbing him by the arm and whirling him headfirst into the wall. Tim's skull bounced off the tile and he went down. Dash took the more a more direct approach. He simply punched Jim in the stomach. Jim folded like a pocket knife and collapsed onto the floor. And just like that, Tim and Jim were out of commission. Without his muscle, Vance suddenly wasn't so tough anymore. Stay back, he yelled, his voice cracking, and then turned me toward stall five, using me as a hush. Let me go, or I'll dunk Teddy. Vance wasn't as big and strong as Tim Jim, however, and he was distracted. I had my chance against him, and I definitely didn't want to end up in the toilet. Before I knew what was happening, my instincts had kicked in. I lifted both legs and kicked off the door frame of stall five, forcing Vance and me backward. Vance, caught by surprise, slipped on the wet floor and tumbled. He landed flat on his back and I landed on top of him, my skull cracking him in the face. That hurt me, but it hurt Vance a lot more. The back of my head caught the right caught him right in his lips. Vance howled in pain, releasing his grip on me. I quickly wiggled free and scrambled to my feet. However, Vance got up just as quickly and snagged my arm, spinning me to face him. His mouth was now full of blood. I'd smashed his lips into his own teeth, making him look even more devilish than usual. I tried to pull free of him. I may have been a lot smaller than Vance. But I was having an, a major adrenaline rush. Vance tried to keep his grip on me, but his feet slipped on the wet floor, and I pitched for and he pitched forward. I leapt out of the way, and as I did, I saw the look on Vance's bloody face shift from anger to terror. 
He pitched past me straight into stall five and landed head first into the toilet of doom. I didn't actually see him do it. Even though Vance had made my life miserable every chance he got, I couldn't bring myself to watch and averted my eyes. The sound was disgusting enough. There was a sickening wet slap as the face plunged in. Then the brief moment of silence and the sound of Vance pulling himself back out and screaming in horror. He lurched out of the stall, wide-eyed, wet toilet paper and things I didn't even want to think about dangling from his hair. He immediately forgotten all about me. Now he only wanted to be clean. He raced toward the sink, only to find that, as usual, the taps weren't working. No, he moaned, and then he bolted from the bathroom, racing right past Ethan and Dash and Tim Jim in search of clean water. It almost sounded as though he was crying as he ran down the hall. Ethan and Dash turned to me and then bust, burst into laughter. That was awesome, Ethan said. Classic, Dash agreed. Students here are going to be talking about this for years. Thanks for saving me, I told them. You should thank your pal Xavier, Ethan said. He's the one who came to get us. Are you all right? Dash asked me. I realized my heart was still hammering in my chest as the result from the result of the adrenaline. My whole body felt numb. I had to check the mirror to make sure I wasn't hurt. I'm fine, I said. Come on, Ethan told me. Let's go get some lunch. After witnessing and smelling everything that had transpired, I wasn't the slightest bit hungry. But I had learned some rules in middle school. One of the major ones was when the varsity football players invite you to lunch, you eat with them. Sure, I said. And we headed for the cafeteria, leaving Tim Jim sprawled out on the bathroom floor behind us. All right, I am going to stop there today, guys. That was two entertaining chapters. I have specific. I really like that second chapter. So, I will po make one more post on Dojo for those of you that actually that chose to listen to the read aloud, like I did for the previous ones. I like post, you know, an assignment that says, you know, name three things that you remember that you remember hearing from the story, like three events that happened, and then you know, I'll ask for an additional, make a prediction of what you think is going to happen the next time that I read. My plan will be, if my schedule allows, I will try to read again on Monday. I do apologize for not being able to read yesterday, but like I said, as a message to to your parent, to your families. Due to circumstances beyond my control, I just didn't have time to do it yesterday. Had some stu stuff to deal with here, and I wasn't able to get sit down in front of a computer and get on to do the read aloud. I missed doing it yesterday, so I'm glad I was able to do it kind of early today. I was able to fit it in, so thank you so much for joining me today. I want to wish you guys a good rest of your Friday. Hopefully you guys are able to kind of do something fun at home. And if you read my message yesterday, you guys should have your packets in the mail. I can't guarantee when you're going to get them, but they were put in the mail Wednesday afternoon. So, and oh, they're in the mail system somewhere. My hope is that sometime next week you get them. It'll have a bunch of different activities that you can do in those. It'll have, you know, some, you know, reading, some, you know, grammar, some language arts, you know, English language arts. It'll have math stuff. It'll have some science, some social studies. I also included a time capsule activity. One of the things that I thought was really cool was another teacher made a time capsule based around our events that's going on right now because we're all living this moment of COVID-19 that they made a time capsule where students can draw, write, you know, things that they're feeling, things that they did, things that they're experiencing, things that they wanted to do but couldn't do. And I thought that that packet would be good for you guys that, you know, 
it's a way to kind of save your memories of what's going on right now. I know you may not want to think, probably don't want to think about the events that are going on right now. And I honestly don't blame you. I feel that way too. But with you guys being young students, it's kind of a good opportunity that, you know, you can write your story down of what you did and what your family did. Because I'm sure many of you, eventually when you're adults, you may very well have kids of your own, families of your own, that, you know, they're going to be learning about this in school and social studies classes down the line. And you could provide what is considered a firsthand historical account from your point of view of how things happened. So I added that time capsule activity as something that you and your families could do together. I think that'd be a good way to kind of, you know, kind of help save some memories. I know I'm kind of doing something similar. I'm writing things down too, to kind of help me remember to kind of save, you know, for passing on my story. Uh, So that could be something else that you could do too. I'll continue making some assignment posts on Dojo. I'll try not to do as many. Last thing I want to do is to overwhelm you guys. I would say any amount of learning that you're able to fit in based on your family's unique schedule is what you got to go with. If the packet is what you want to do and that's what's easiest for you, then by all means work on the packet every day. There's enough material that's going to be coming to you in that packet where you guys should be set for a couple weeks. My plan was to send a packet every week, but then I saw the size of the packet. And I'm like, you know what? This is enough to keep them busy for a few weeks. So once you get this packet, I'll let you guys have an opportunity to look at it, maybe work through it. If you guys have any questions, you are more than welcome to message me, ask me for help if you guys need it. I am going to set up office hours where that will be my time where I get to sit down and I will go through any messages that you guys have and then offer any assistance or help that you guys may need. And I will be posting that very soon on Dojo that I will post my office hours. I know Mrs. Feather is working on her own office hours. It may be, you know, a different day from mine, but, you know, I'm going to try to pick a day and pick a time frame that can fit with, you know, what's going on in my life where I can commit to that. And that'll be my commitment to you and the families that, you know, if you need my help, I will set that time aside that I will make myself available to be able to assist you as best as I can. And know that it's still, per- if even if it's outside of the office hours, it's still okay to message me. I will still see it. And I will promise when it's my office hours that I will make it a point to answer you then. So I will update you guys. My plan is to post that sometime today on dojo with my office hours that way you families could write that down so you guys know when i will be on and be making myself available my plan like i said will still will be the packets i will post some links i will post some videos on dojo that you guys can watch and answer some questions about so i think very much that's how i'm going to do the science and particularly social studies Uh, I've been posting links to be able to get access to the PowerPoints. Part of the pack, it's going to be the the study guides or the note takers. So if you're unable to access the digitals, know that it's part of the packet that's coming. And the video, the video link that I post, it's my Flipgrid from my Flipgrid account. And it's a short, you know, at most 10 minutes and it's me going through the PowerPoint and reading it. So if you can't download my PowerPoint, you can at least watch the video. And the good thing about the video is if I'm going too fast, you could always rewind it. And then you could like pause it on a particular slide that I'm on. And then you could fill in your note taker with whatever information you still need to fill in. So that's kind of the good thing about it. You can pause it, you can rewind it. And then I won't care if you're constantly going back and forth on my video. That's perfectly fine with me. That's why it's there. So 
be sure to keep a lookout for those office hours. I'll post them on Dojo, and then I'll post, you know, the discussion topic for the book. You know, name your three events that you remember and your one prediction. And that's kind of it, guys. Thank you so much for joining me today. You guys take it easy. Stay safe. Stay healthy. And I'll see you for the next Read Aloud on Monday. See you later, guys.